a man on a mission to lend a hand across the country, and he makes a stop right here in Portland. I thought there was still good in this world, but I didn't think there was, I was beginning to think there wasn't so much. And we're talking about the dangers of vaping with serious cases of respiratory illness across the country. Now local doctors are looking into a death here that could be linked to the trend, plus a senseless murder. Investigators nab a married couple. They say shot into a crowd, randomly killing a young man from Tigard. Your news starts now. And we are going to start with kind of a grim milestone here in Portland. At this point, there have now been more people killed on city streets so far this year than in all of last year. A crash this week marked the 36th traffic death. That's compared to 34 deaths in all of last year and 45 in all of 2017. It comes four years after Portland leaders committed to that Vision Zero plan. You remember that? To eliminate traffic deaths altogether. KGW's Catherine Cook takes a look at one safety change they hope is making a difference. It was upsetting. Paul Rich was home when an 82 year old woman was struck and killed near his house last June. She was crossing Southeast 71st and Foster. Ironically, it happened the same day the city wrapped its Foster Road improvement project. There was a ceremony to acknowledge that and then to have that happen that very same day seemed very unfortunate. That woman was one of 36 people killed in crashes on Portland streets this year. She also represents a growing number of people ages 65 and older killed while crossing the street. The percentage of fatalities that are pedestrian deaths in Portland is very high. Hannah Schaefer with Peabot says one of the city's strategies to make people safer is placing these no crossing signs at select intersections. In Oregon, all intersections, including the 80,000 in Portland, are considered unmarked crosswalks, giving walkers the right of way. Schaefer says Peabot uses these signs as a last resort. Our transportation strategy prioritizes people walking, and so the first thing that we do when we look at a crosswalk is look for a way to make people safely be able to cross it. Less than a month after that woman was killed on Foster and 71st, the city placed a no crossing sign where it happened. We found several other no crossing signs along Southeast Foster, including this one, just feet from a flashing crosswalk. People would just probably not even notice this if they thought they could cross at the corner. Right now, 150 of them have these no crossing signs. Peabot believes that's a relatively low number, but some critics disagree with the concept of the signs altogether. BikePortland.org has reported extensively on the city and state's joint effort to use these no crossing signs. Referencing drivers, the site asks, is Portland ceding our streets to the most dangerous users? If every corner is a crosswalk, why aren't all corners open? I can sort of understand somebody's perspective with that, but I feel that it's a safety thing and on certainly on these busy roads. Back at Foster and 71st, Paul says he appreciates the changes the city has made here, adding bike lanes and reducing traffic lanes from two in each direction down to one. There are a lot more people who walk around in this neighborhood now than there were even just a year ago. So it's done that. In Southeast Portland, Catherine Cook, KGW News. Now we want to get you caught up on some of uh, tonight's other headlines. They include a deadly crash west of Portland. It shut down Highway 26 for hours this afternoon. A driver from Beaverton was driving east on 26. He went off the road and smashed into the, dead the Dennis Edwards Tunnel. That's west of Banks on the way to the coast. The driver, 48-year-old Ken Duong, died at the scene. Police say a man stabbed a stranger in a parking lot in northeast Portland's Lloyd District. Some strange details to this story. The victim was apparently an employee of a restaurant. He was on break at the time in a Taco Bell parking lot. And police say Jordan Powell Matthewson approached this person, this victim, stabbed him multiple times, then walked to his car in the parking lot and stayed there and waited to get arrested. The victim is expected to survive. Five people, including this man, have been charged with rioting in connection with some dueling protests between right and left wing groups earlier this month. Court documents are saying that Antonio Zamora was part of the group that surrounded buses full of Proud Boys and members of Patriot Prayer. Some highlighted there in the video. That's who they believe he is. Identified in the court documents as the person there in the teal shirt and rainbow striped ski mask. He allegedly kicked one bus window and threw a heavy object at another window. Prosecutors won't say if the four other men charged were also involved in this specific incident. Hey, we want to turn to weather right now. A pleasant Friday, just really beautiful out there. A great night to kick off your holiday weekend. Chief Meteorologist Matt Safino has our Labor Day forecast. Hey, Matt. 
It is a great night. It is clear outside. Temperature sitting at 67. So cooler than the last few nights, but of course the air mass has been cooling down in general. Just absolutely beautiful. We also had a stunning sunset from our Cannon Beach sky cam. With the clouds zipping on in though, a precursor to the potential for some showers on the coast tomorrow. We'll talk more about that in just a bit, but it really did light up the sky quite nice there. So here is your weekend forecast. Partly sunny Saturday and Sunday, about 83 tomorrow, 80 on Sunday and a little bit warmer on Monday. I mentioned the potential for some showers along the coast. They are there with that weakening system there, but you know what system is not weakening? Hurricane Dorian, now a major category four hurricane with winds of 140 miles an hour. I'll have the latest on its updated track a little bit later. Dan, back to you. Lots more to learn from Matt. Thank you, sir. We'll talk to you soon. We got some new information tonight for you on the death of a young Tigard High School graduate. Apparently now they're saying a husband and wife are the ones facing some murder charges for shooting and killing Alex Graydon, this 21 year old who was gunned down in Eugene in May. KGW's Mike Benner talked to detectives about this new update in the case. Authorities are calling these latest developments bittersweet. As you might imagine, they are thrilled that they tracked down two suspects. But at the same time, they remain heartbroken that such a fine young man is gone. We've had this up. This framed photo of Alex Graydon has been a fixture inside the Eugene Police Department since early May. And each time we walk past that photo, it would be a nice reminder that we're doing this for a good reason. Detectives will tell you they've been working tirelessly to solve the 21 year old's murder. You may recall the Tigard High School grad and Lane Community College student was gunned down in the early morning hours of May 4th. Graydon was walking through a parking lot behind the popular Taylor's Bar and Grill right on the edge of the University of Oregon campus. Alex did absolutely nothing wrong. He was a good student in our investigation. We found nobody that has anything bad to say about Alex. He's a very kind person and he was struck down by this horrible act. About a week after the horrible act, as investigators call it, authorities identified two suspects, a husband and a wife. And on Thursday, officers went after them. They arrested 29-year-old Kaylee Von Foster during a traffic stop in the Portland area. 30-year-old Regis Kindred was already in custody in Multnomah County on an unrelated charge. The couple is now facing murder charges. Evidence in this case shows that the murder of Alex Graydon was a result of violence motivated by gang-related acts. This is most troubling because Alex had zero affiliation with any gang. As detectives try to wrap their heads around the tragedy, they're looking to speak with this guy. He may go by the name Kane. He's not a suspect, but perhaps a witness to the crime that took the life of a young man with a promising future. Alex was loved by family and friends in Eugene and Tigard and his birth country of Kenya. That right there was part of a statement from the Graydon family. They are asking anyone with information about Alex's murder to continue passing it along to the Eugene Police Department. Back to you. All right, Mike, thank you. So tonight, people who work with Portland's homeless, they're saying that there's a string of violent incidents we've seen this week, and it's pointing to what's been a larger problem in that community. Yesterday, we learned that two homeless people were sleeping on a sidewalk when they were hit, uh, hit by a car fleeing a crash. That happened in southeast Portland, and these victims got seriously injured, and police still haven't found the driver who did it. Hours later, that same day, the Multnomah County DA sending us some photos here of a, a charred tent and some other belongings you see. They said a homeowner set this fire because he was angry that the campers were there. He's been charged now with a misdemeanor. And on Wednesday, you'll probably remember that we reported the story of a homeless woman in Eugene, 57-year-old Annette Montero. She was in a parking lot. She was wrapped in a sleeping bag, and someone driving a garbage truck drove over her and killed her. A rep from the Joint Office of Homeless Services said that sadly they hear stories from homeless people all the time, every day in fact, about the violence that they face. You face violence, you face bias crimes, you face medical crises. If you have no support and you have a heart attack or a medical issue, there's no one there for you, you're very vulnerable that way. Accidents happen. People, uh, half of the deaths we saw in the most recent year we tracked were people who died of accidental causes. So he's talking about tracking those deaths. He's talking about the report you're looking at right there. That's the cover of it. That's the domicile unknown report. It's uh, saying in 2017, 79 homeless people died, 40 of them by accident, and that includes overdoses. Four did die by homicide. Officials add a lot of other crimes against homeless people just aren't reported out there because the victims, they think uh, that no one is going to believe them.
Providence Health, they're looking into whether vaping played a role in the death of one of its patients back in July. Now, this comes as people are being hospitalized across the country for severe respiratory illnesses. Now, I want to stress here, in the Providence case, hospital officials, they haven't come to any solid conclusions yet about a connection to vaping with this death, but they are seriously looking into it. Recently, the CDC and health officials have been sending out warnings. They uh, have investigated hundreds of cases nationwide. The Oregon Health Authority stressed today that while vaping might not be as bad for you as regular cigarettes, it's definitely not good. There's a, a range of things um, like the toxic chemicals that I mentioned that can cause cancer. We know those are present in these devices. Things like heavy metals and fine particles can be inhaled from the devices. The OHA wants doctors at this point to tell them whenever they have patients who come in that have shortness of breath, a cough, or chest pain. And we're not talking about the average cough here. We're talking about people, some of them have been put on ventilators. All right, I've got a lot more to talk about here. College football, for instance, is back. You knew that. The Beavers, they hit the field against Oklahoma State tonight. The game is still going on, and we're going to have highlights ahead in sports. But first. I'm overwhelmed, actually. I think this is great. <laughs> really a great thing. You're going to love this woman in this interview. You're going to love the whole story. In fact, it started as a very simple mission to just mow lawns, and it has grown into so much more. We caught up with this Alabama, Alabama man who's been helping people in need all around the country and training the next generation to give back.